the next thing I want to do, I can do it here. Um, just talk about key areas. I mean, we're being asked about what, what subjects are relevant to, to biomedical engineering. And, you know, I think you'll see as we go along, uh, science and mathematics subjects are what are relevant and, and helpful for biomedical engineering. Mathematics, by the way, in our university is the, is the, is the requirement. Uh, other subjects, you can uh, come in and learn from first year on if you've not done biology, if you've not done physics or whatever. Uh, mathematics at an honors level is required for our program. There may be ones out there that don't require that. Um, but we'll talk about a few medical devices, and I think it's kind of a good context in which to kind of show why it's complicated to design them and why we, uh, why we need to have certain skills and scientific knowledge to do it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about biomechanics and computational modeling. Tanya will talk about uh, tissue engineering, as I, I mentioned. And then finally, an, a project that's um, going on uh, in DC at the moment uh, in collaboration with a lot of European partners and led by a French company, uh, an automated biomaterials risk assessment European project. I'll talk a little bit about that. Maybe that will be interesting. Okay. So to, uh, to see if you're, uh, you know, what you can, uh, find out about. We have a poll here. I've got a, a medical device. Um, what does it do? Uh, do you know? Do you recognize it? Or can you guess uh, what, what that medical device does? And there's four options uh, that I'm putting up or putting up on the poll. Uh, is it a dental implant? Is it a, an implant for so shoulder replacement surgery? Or for a knee replacement surgery? Or for a chin implant for facial reconstruction. So if you could uh, answer that poll in the next few seconds, that'd be great and we'll just see what everyone thinks. Great, there's lots of answers coming in there, uh, Gareth. So we'll give people a minute more and just see if people know what it is. Okay, and thanks for all the questions and I'll definitely uh, get to them or Tanya will, uh, we're both uh, looking at them. Okay, so the answers are slowing down a bit. Um, okay. So maybe we'll... Yeah, we'll a have a look and see, but... Yeah. Uh, Okay, everybody answered. So I'm going to end the poll now. Okay, so hopefully you can see my, my screen there sharing the results. So um, lots of people have different ideas, I suppose, about what it's for. 12% um, think it's a dental implant, 28% a shoulder replacement, an implant for shoulder replacement, 38% think it's an implant for knee replacement surgery, and 21% think it's a chin implant for facial reconstruction. Okay, that's great. And uh, the, the uh, correct answer is that it's a component as most, uh, not most people, but the highest number of people said um, for knee replacement surgery. And you can see how it fits in there. It connects to the femur uh, where there's damage to uh, cartilage or, you know, the bone surface generally uh, at the knee um, and where that's gotten to a point where a replacement is needed, then this uh, the, the component we saw is one of a, a number of pieces that goes into the implant for knee replacement. And uh, you can see the shiny surface. It's, it's something that has to uh, articulate with respect to uh, other components and be low friction to give a good natural uh, knee movement. Very successful, uh, you know, type of uh, surgery and implant. Okay, so that's how it fits in. Uh, it's Again, an implant that will require uh, manufacture, obviously, using engineering methods. Uh, it, it's an implant that um, must be compatible in terms of uh, not generating a, an unwanted reaction with the body from a kind of a chemical or a corrosion point of view. So the materials for these are selected very carefully. Um, and uh, you know, uh, with the kind of understanding and the courses that we do in, in biomaterials, you would uh, gain insight into that. 
Okay. So a, a second one, and this will be, it's just the two that were opposed that we're going to do, but um, what does this particular medical device do and, and, and do you recognize it? And the options for this poll are, uh, does it treat a, um, a bulge in an artery to stop it from expanding and, and bursting? Does it pass electrical signals from an implanted pacemaker to heart tissue? Uh, is it a guide wire along which balloons and stents can be moved through arteries? Uh, or could it be a wire to be used for holding together bone fragments and to assist bone repair? So uh, if you want to uh, give us your, your opinion there, that'd be great. And maybe I'll take a look at the questions uh, when we have the results for this poll in. Great, so there's lots of answers coming in again. It's a divided opinion on this one. Okay, it's not as easy, I think. <laughs> so we'll just give everyone a, a couple of seconds more and then we'll close the poll. Still more answers coming in. <laughs> okay, that might be everybody now at this stage. I'm going to just close the poll and we'll see the results. Okay, um, so yeah, it's divided all right. I can see it on my screen here. Yeah. And yeah. Um, the 9% think it's to treat a bulge in an artery. Uh, to stop it from expanding and bursting. 31% the pacemaker lead, 27% a guide wire, and 33% for uh, bone fragments. Um, in fact, the 9% are right, um, but it's a very counterintuitive medical device. I really think it's, uh, it was, uh, it's, you'd never, how did they come up with this? Um, but what happens is where there is an aneurysm, which is a bulge in an artery, and particularly the one shown here is in uh, an artery near the brain, then uh, and you can see the sort of bulge that happens. It starts from a weakness in the wall of an artery and can uh, expand out to become something that, that's at risk of bursting and, um, you know, which could, would be very dangerous. And uh, by filling it with uh, coils, such as shown at the tip of that wire that we had on the previous image, we, um, you can uh, create a situation where the, you get, uh, the aneurysm is, is filled, the blood within it clots, and uh, you avoid that buildup of pulsating pressure that puts it at risk of, uh, of burst, bursting. So um, the, interestingly, the the coil at the tip of the wire is, uh, is released by passing a current, um, at least in one version, and uh, you can kind of break away and withdraw the full, the long catheter, the long wire, and leave behind the coiled wire that's uh, in the blood vessel. So um, some, some of the, the types of implants and treatments that have uh, you know, been determined over time are you know, very creative and innovative um, and very successful, certainly procedures like this that have uh, been conducted over a long periods of time um, and have proven uh, successful over that time. Okay, so uh, I think I'm going to jump to the questions um, for a minute. And uh, so what is the difference between a medical physicist and a biomedical engineer? Um, the, I mean, the topics, uh, I don't really want to talk too much about medical physicists because I'm not one. Um, there is a degree program in, in, in TCU and probably other universities uh, around physics and uh, biomedical sciences. Um, I think the biomedical engineers will tend to design devices uh, and um, work, you know, in the end, a lot of them work in medical device companies, the major multinationals or startups. Um, medical physicists perhaps 
can uh, be uh, found in, in hospital laboratories uh, more so than in medical device companies. Okay. Um, obviously, the topics underpinning topics of physics and engineering, there's some overlap, but uh, they are quite different. I mean, advanced physics, uh, you know, we pursue in biomedical engineering often a design and computational, uh, let's say, um, you know, simulation uh, activities, uh, perhaps to a greater extent than medical physicists would. Okay. Um, where can you work after studying biomedical engineering? Well, uh, a lot of people, as I said, go into big and small medical device companies. Um, others go into research, uh, stay in universities, perhaps, or big research centers that are publicly funded, or uh, sometimes uh, go into different careers entirely, to be honest. I mean, we've had people go forward into graduate uh, entry, um, uh, also into, into kind of other branches of clinical engineering, uh, working within hospitals. Um, but I would say the majority end up uh, wanting to work in medical device companies of uh, either large or small and they're dotted around the country um, as we see later. Okay. Um, okay, so many questions. Uh, what material is the knee replacement made out of? Um, well, it would be a titanium alloy. Okay, uh, and so there's, there's a number of different uh, uh, metallic al alloys that have been found and developed uh, you know, with great suitability for implant applications. And uh, you know, one of the big considerations, as, as I said, is their biocompatibility. Um, but that's what it's, it's a titanium alloy. Um, which science, science subjects done at the leading circle would be most useful? Um, I think you, you sort of have to do maths to go into most of the biomedical engineering degree programs, uh, maths at honors level. Uh, and after that, I would think, just think science subjects, whichever science subjects uh, are available to you or appeal to you. Um, they all come into play, but we don't re require in, in our university, and I think it's probably in general, any specific one, but it's helpful to have done some before if you can. And what would be some of the things you both work on on a daily basis and how has COVID affected your work? Uh, okay. Um, we're lecturers on the degree program. We do research as well. I mean, I think that's an important thing. And I'll talk later about a research project that I'm involved in, Tanya's in, in, involved in different ones. Uh, so we maybe cover, cover that. COVID, it's the same as for everybody else. Um, researchers in the laboratories in the universities uh, are able to continue working. I think though, not uh, from the student point of view, just for this year, uh, there's been impact on uh, on laboratory work. And so a lot of things are being done sort of remotely that wouldn't have been in other years and won't be in future years. Okay. Um, okay, I think I'll maybe uh, move, move on and we'll come back to some questions or maybe Tanya could look at some of them. Um, and I'll just uh, talk a little bit and maybe it'll answer some of the questions I see coming up there. Um, but biomechanics and, and computational modeling. And again, the stent example. And uh, so, um, you know, how do we design? We looked at the, the image and it's there again, but how do we design uh, stents in order to perform all the different uh, functions that they need to perform? And one, one aspect is that they are essentially a structure that is uh, you know, sustaining me mechanical loads and fluctuating ones over long periods of time. Um, experiencing pulsating blood flow, as well as the, um, you know, the initial elastic recoil of the artery. And you can build, and if you can see on the image on the right there, uh, the, the structure has been broken down into what are called elements in a, in a, in a, in a finite element model. Uh, and that gives uh, an ability to do a computer simulation, which will um, allow us to see what the stresses are, for example, in the uh, stent itself at different locations, where are the hot spots, but also what stresses uh, is the stent transmitting into the artery and how can those be minimized? Because that's one of the things that you want to do to kind of minimize the, uh, you know, the, the degree to which you're transmitting unnatural levels of force uh, or unwanted levels of force into the artery. Okay. Um, so uh, that would be the basis of a stress analysis model uh, in order to determine where 
the hot spots of stress are in both the tissue uh, and in the stent. And to do that, you need to understand about the mechanics and mechanical properties of both the stent material and the, the artery itself. So it becomes one of the subjects that needs to be studied is understanding the, the mechanics of tissues and how they deform in response to the loads that are placed on them um, and uh, you know, what are natural and what are um, excessive loadings. Okay. So uh, in, in the example at the bottom of this, I mean, what I'm talking about in text is uh, really why these methods that are uh, brought over from mechanical engineering and, and civil engineering are uh, finite element modeling to find, as you can see at the bottom right there, uh, stress hotspots, areas where the stresses are higher than others and areas where you might need to uh, redesign or at least have some concern. And uh, specifically for medical devices, um, in vivo and in vitro testing, which means in vivo means in, in a living organism such as an animal or a person, and in vitro generally means a laboratory-based testing, um, can be impossible or difficult or not as conclusive, um, but uh, well, in vivo is pretty con conclusive, but the, um, it's a design aid to try to understand uh, what we have here is a hip implant, as you can see on the uh, over here, that is um, implanted into a bone where the femoral head has been uh, removed because it was diseased and the um, uh, channel has been reamed out for the femur, femoral implant to go into. And what you're worrying about is what stresses will this you know, sustain in the implant, but also uh, bone health is very dependent on the, the stresses and strains uh, that bone experiences. And so we want to, to remain in uh, with stresses that are uh, as close as possible to the natural levels, even though uh, you know a fairly unnatural um, event has happened and we now have a metallic hip implant there. Okay. So these techniques that we learn about in biomedical engineering of stress analysis and uh, uh, combined with understanding of the anatomy and the properties of the tissues like arteries or bone um, help us to do this kind of analysis and redesign and improve medical implants. Okay, and now uh, I'll hand over to, to Tanya to talk a little bit about tissue engineering. Great, and um, thanks, Garrett. Uh, so as Garrett mentioned, I'm a lecturer in biomedical engineering in DCU as well. Um, and a lot of my research work uh, is in the area of tissue engineering. And um, so you might have heard of tissue engineering before, or you might not have. Um, so I'm going to give you just a little bit of a background about what it's all about. Um, so tissue engineering, it's quite a new area within the area of biomedical engineering. And it's an area that's grow it's growing quite fast, and there's a lot of research happening in this area at the moment. The overall aim of tissue engineering is to repair or replace or regenerate tissue and organs in the body. And so currently there's lots of research into looking at how we might repair or regenerate all different types of tissue in the body and using this tissue engineering approach. And so in the body, various types of injuries and disease can happen. And so for example, you can have damage to the bone and cartilage. So you can have a traumatic injury from sports, you can have various diseases that cause damage to the bone and um, age also is a big factor. So as we get older, our bones get weaker due to diseases such as osteoporosis and we can have damage to our cartilage from diseases such as um, arthritis. And um, so all these things happen, happen to us as, as we age. Um, also, then we can have things like um, injuries to. So here we have we're talking about um, reconstructive surgery uh, to the to the jaw um, if you have some kind of traumatic injury. Um, so in tissue engineering, we're, what we're trying to do is to come up with a new approach to, to heal these types of injuries. Um, and every tissue in the body has different regenerative capacity and diff different regenerative ability. And um, so some tissues heal better than others. So if you imagine if you go out and break your arm and um, you can get a cast on your arm and after a certain amount of time, usually that bone will heal, heal quite well. And um, sometimes it won't, um, but bone has, has quite good regenerative ability. Whereas cartilage, if you damage your cartilage, it doesn't have any ability to repair itself at all. So if you damage your cartilage tissue, um, 
then it, it can't heal itself at all. So there's, there's different needs from different tissues in the body in terms of, of how we want to try and treat them and repair them. Um, so other diseases then, so vascular disease is another big um, area um, that, that causes a lot of um, uh, injury or disability for people all around the world. And it accounts for 49% of all deaths in European countries. So it's a big cause of death. Um, and one way that this is treated is through bypass surgery. And so we can also use things like stents that Gareth mentioned already, and you can put them into your arteries. But if you can't use a stent, then, then they do what's called a bypass surgery. And they take a vessel from somewhere else in the body and they put it in um, to, to bypass that vessel in the body that's blocked or, or damaged. So one area of tissue engineering is to try and come up with um, new vessels that could actually replace these, these vessels that are, are taken currently from the body. So the current procedure that a surgeon would do, they'd harvest a vessel, usually it's taken from the leg, and they put it in to bypass these blocked vessels in the heart. Um, so tissue engineering would hopefully come up with a vessel you could grow in the lab and that you could uh, make in the lab and have ready then for when the patient needs it uh, during the surgical procedure and you could just implant it and it would, it would avoid all those issues of having to harvest the vessel from somewhere else in the body. So other tissues then like the skin and the cornea in your eye, there's also lots of research into developing new approaches for those. Um, and then also um, uh, trying to come up with uh, total organs. So uh, to try and develop a full working heart that you could replace or working lungs, you could grow up in the lab and then actually implant into people. So this is all areas of research at the moment that hopefully um, will, be, will become a reality at some point um, in the not too distant future. You want to? Okay. Yeah, great, let's move forward, thanks. <laughs> okay, so this kind of gives a, a schematic of what happens in tissue engineering. So we start with our person here over at number one um, and we harvest some cells from that person and the cells are then grown up um, in a lab. And this little flask here, this is a, a cell culture flask. And we have this special pink liquid in there, which is our cell culture media. And we put the cells into the cell culture media and they can grow then um, in the lab. So you can grow up these cells. So you have lots and lots of cells then that you can uh, use to treat the, um, the patient or the, the injury. Those cells can then be put onto a scaffold or matrix. So you can see in, in number three there, we have this uh, little scaffold material and we can put these cells onto this scaffold. Um, all these little squiggly lines, these are growth factors and um, that uh, help to promote those cells to produce the particular tissue that you're trying to grow. So for example, we could have taken these cells from uh, cartilage in that person. And these could be cartilage cells now that we're growing up onto this little um, scaffold here onto our matrix. And you can see in our zoomed in little section there, we have the, um, the matrix components. We have our, uh, all our little growth factors there and then all the cells all growing together and producing cartilage. So in step four, then you put those into a little dish. And again, this is a little Petri dish with some cell culture media in it and you can grow it in the lab grow all those cartilage cells to produce what would be a tissue engineered scaffold for cartilage repair. And this could be put back into the damaged cartilage in the patient and repair that cartilage. Okay, so this is the, the kind of general idea of what we're trying to achieve uh, with tissue engineering, to be able to replace tissues like this, to grow them in the lab, um, and then just be able to implant them directly into a person to replace whatever that damaged tissue is. So if this was successful, so at the moment we we use things. Um, no, that's okay. Sorry. Um, at the moment we use things like um, the knee prosthesis that Garrett showed you already. And so if somebody has very bad osteoarthritis, their knees get worse and worse, and they get very painful and very sore. And and currently there isn't really a very good way uh, to actually treat that cartilage. So the patient would eventually need to go and have a, a knee replacement procedure. So if we could get these artificial um, tissue engineered cartilage materials that we could produce in the lab, then once the, the, the person ends up with damage to their cartilage, we could grow them up some new cartilage and implant it into the person and we'd, we wouldn't need to go and have these knee replacement procedures being carried out. Um, so if, if we could get this all to work, um, it would be, be a really good advantage uh, for patients and it would, it would prevent a lot of the pain and um, things that patients currently have. Um, so why is it so important? So current remedies to tissue and organ loss, they have various shortcomings. Okay, so we mentioned there's 
various ways we can treat these kinds of injuries at the moment. So we can have transplantation. So in the example there we spoke about um, for our coronary arteries, we can have um, donor vessels that we take from elsewhere in the body and we put in uh, in a bypass procedure. Um, or we can also have um, donor organs. So you hear people having um, uh, lung, uh, donor lungs um, implanted or things like that. So there's various limitations with that. So one is that there's donor scarcity. So we don't have enough of these donor organs out there. Um, if you're taking the tissue from somewhere else in the patient's body, then we have what's called donor site morbidity. So what that means is that we have, and um, it's a very technical term to have in our talk maybe, but um, what that means is that we have some um, loss or uh, injury to that site where we have to take that blood vessel from. So we, if we're having the second surgical site to harvest some, some tissue from, then the person has a sore leg and they have a sore heart at the same time. And um, so that's not ideal. And then there's also a uh, potential for problems with rejection as well. So if we're taking tissue from some another person to put into our, our patient, they might reject it. And um, so you have to have anti-rejection medication. And um, so it mightn't be a successful approach. We also mentioned that we could have things like prostheses, so like our knee prosthesis. So we have some images here. This is a, a heart valve and you can see at the top. And this is a, a replacement um, meniscus here from a knee joint um, or from a yeah from a replacement knee joint and you can see that this is worn away so this is 9.5 years um, after it was implanted into into a person that started to wear away so if we put in these kind of uh, mechanical devices they don't last forever and um, so sometimes they can fail quite quickly um, or sometimes they can last and work very well for five or ten years but then they start to fail and then you need to go in and need to, you need to replace them. So if we could have a successful tissue engineering approach then that would be just the tissue healed and we wouldn't need to go in and try and um, replace um, these devices after a certain amount of time. This is the okay. last one on tissue engineering. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so tissue engineering, it involves um, all sorts of aspects of, of engineering. So um, as we mentioned, within biomedical engineering overall, we bring together different expertise in terms of understanding of the biology of the body. Um, so we need to understand how the body works. Um, we need to also understand material science. So what materials are we going to use and what materials are going to be safe? And as Garrett said, not all materials are safe to go in the body. The body likes some materials and it doesn't like other materials. So things like titanium, the body likes, um, whereas other materials, the body would have quite a strong reaction against and you would get a big inflammatory response to them. Um, so in tissue engineering, we need to really understand what materials the body likes and what it doesn't like. We also need to understand engineering technologies. And um, so that can include all kinds of things relating to the development of materials um, and also then the production of scaffolds. So using approaches like 3D printing to produce scaffolds and uh, using various fabrication techniques. And then we also use things like biomechanics and computer modeling. And so we can try and model um, how these materials be would behave in the body. And we can use computer models to understand and um, the different loading environment that would be present in the body and, and see how those materials can and react under particular types of load in the body as well. And so it's a, a very interesting field. It brings in lots of different areas of engineering and of science and combines them all together. And I suppose with the overall aim of trying to help people and bring about better outcomes for patients. So I don't know if we have, do you want to answer some more questions at this stage or will we move on to the yeah, next? Yeah, I think that's, that's, I was just looking um, at several questions that have come in, so. Yeah. Um, I think if we go back, so do you deal with physical blood or is it just pictures and diagrams? I suppose this is in a, in a biomedical engineering program. Um, yeah. So the, I suppose, sorry, yeah, do you want to answer, Gary? Yeah, so I suppose mainly, um, so within a, within our degree program, um, we don't have blood really in the lab from, from day to day. And um, so we, we do lots of experimental work, but we don't really work with, with human blood. Um, but when you get to um, fourth year in the degree program or fifth year in the master's program, you get the chance to do a final year project. Um, and that project can involve 
various different things. So um, you could at that stage maybe be working with um, some kind of tissue from, from an animal or something. There's various different um, options or projects. Um, so in that type of project, you might get uh, kind of more in depth into um, a particular aspect um, of some area of biomedical engineering. But general day-to-day, uh, -day what we do in our in our labs um, for the for our teaching, uh, we don't we don't use blood. Uh, would a knee replacement need to be designed specifically for the person? Um, I think uh, they. Uh, I mean, there are different sizes, obviously, uh, to fit to be to kind of um, deal with you know, people with different different size knees. Um, I think the personalization of this is something that will you know is is desired and may come for the future. It's underway, perhaps, but wouldn't currently be the situation. There there would be specific sizes uh, for you know, a range of sizes and also for children and things like that. So um, I think, and we'll mention it again later, but there's an increasing direction towards personalization of medical devices. And there's a lot of research around that as to being able to kind of specify something particular for the particular person that would work best for them. Um, but uh, there's a lot of research work needed to underpin that uh, and I think it's kind of being pursued is the way I would put it. I don't know, do you, is that uh, okay? Um, can professional athletes use knee replacements and still be at their best? I've not heard of anybody having a knee replacement while a, you know, while a professional athlete. I tend to be people a little older than that, uh, that it happens to. Um, Maybe it depends on the sport. <laughs> it may depend on the sport. Maybe yeah. a golfer could. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, are there any books that I can look at to show me what the maths aspect is like in engineering? Um, well, there are there are engineering you know textbooks that we use. Um, I don't know that I can think of the name at the moment. I don't teach the maths myself, um, but the the ma maths is done to a level. Uh, for what we need for engineering. It's not, we don't uh, pursue as a pure maths uh, objective. So we are trying always to um, bring the maths in and show its relevance and, and you know, deal with maths that uh, is, a, is, is suitable for modeling physical things. Um, so I don't think people need to absolutely love maths to do engineering. Um, you can love lots of different aspects of engineering and you can in the end be uh you know move your career towards uh whatever it is in engineering that most excites you so uh you're not really uh, maths is you know is important and, and and people do like mathematical modeling of the kind that we showed earlier the, the stress analysis and so on um but there's a bigger picture to engineering as well so uh yeah i think um yeah i think maybe the kind of problem solving aspect of maths is something that it might be useful to enjoy so in, in engineering we focus a lot on the kind of problem solving and um, so enjoying problem solving um i think would be would be good um, I actually have the maths book on my shelf, so just grabbed it. This is one of the maths books. It's, oh, it's back to front of my image. That's one of the maths books they use in first year, um, Engineering Maths by Shroud. So I don't know if you managed to find a copy of that anywhere. I think in general, the maths is kind of a progression of what you do at Leaving Cert. So it's lots of the same types of topics that you're just getting a bit more in depth into. Um, so things like integrating and differentiating that you're, you're doing it just in a bit more detail and more depth as well as bringing in some new new topics as well. But it's kind of expanding on a lot of what you what you do at Leaving Cert level. Okay, do you design medical devices? Uh, we've been asked, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> Kind of, there, yes, in some senses. I mean, there are certainly there are people uh, pursuing kind of commercialization of research. So what, what would tend to happen with university staff is um, that we would work at something fairly cutting edge and hope uh, down the line to commercialize that uh, by uh, going through all the hoops to, to prove it safe and effective and 
you know, mean that it could be brought through to, to be used on, on patients in the end. Um, but it, it's all linked in with doing cutting edge research. Okay. I see one there about how would you get a stent into an artery? And um, so in our um, uh, surgical device technology module that we do in fourth year, um, usually we haven't been able to now this year because of COVID, but usually we go to um, Beaumont Hospital as a, a clinical practice part of the program. Um, and we get to see um, a lab there where they actually implant stents. And so the way they do it, they use a, what's called a, a catheter and a guide wire. Um, and they implant it up through the um, femoral artery, usually, which is a really large artery um, in your leg. Um, and you can guide it up using these guide wires and you use an X-ray to see what, where it's going in the body. So it's a very skilled technique that the surgeons do. Um, they follow up along through the artery and then they position it into the um, place where it needs to go in the car in the artery. But I think a really kind of useful or interesting part of our program is that um, clinical visit that, that we, we get to do with the fourth year class where we go to Beaumont and, and they get to see some of these procedures being done. Okay, and Tanya, why did you want to become a biomedical engineer? Um, okay, so I'll answer this one maybe. So um, for me, so I actually did the biomedical engineering program in DCU um, a few years ago. I won't tell you how many. Um, so I suppose for me, um, I was really interested in, in lots of things in school. So I liked biology and physics and maths. And I was looking for something that kind of brought a lot of those um, skills together, a lot of those interests together. And I liked the kind of problem solving idea um, of engineering. Um, but then that it was applied to actually helping people and, and helping helping humans. Um, so that's, I suppose, what, what attracted, attracted me to biomedical engineering. Um, and I think it is that good mix of um, problem solving and physics and maths um, and biology and, and kind of bringing all of that together to, to look for solutions um, that help people. So, yeah, I suppose that, that was what attracted me. Okay, and just from my own point of view, I came to it after already having worked in other areas in engineering. And uh, I found it uh, just the, in, the engineering, uh, the actual topics were very interesting. You know, when you get down to the, it's advanced engineering and it's, uh, it's very interesting um, to focus in on things that are as involved as that. Um, so that was, uh, that was what, what, what drew me in really was the, the interest uh, from the engineering perspective, okay. Um, so is it difficult to grow a working organ without a stem cell? Um, yeah, so growing working organs is very difficult and there's still a lot of research, so it hasn't been done successfully yet. Um, and they would use various types of cells. So stem cells you can get from lots of locations in the body. So actually all, all of our bodies have stem cells working there all the time and um, helping to regenerate and repair tissue. So um, you can get them from lots of tissues from your bone marrow and um, you can get them from fat cells even, which I think is a nice um, source of, of stem cells because people don't want to have fat, but they do want to have stem cells for use in regenerative medicine. Um, so yeah, generally some type of stem cell might be used, um, but it's, it's still a little, a little way away from having a, a working organ. But, um, lots of research still going on there. Um, someone asking about prosthetic limbs. Um, I mean, there's, what stage are they at? Well, there's, I mean, there's many different uh, forms of prosthetic limb. And mo for most uh, scenarios, um, you're not talking about something that is automated, you know, there's a, has external power or anything like that. You're talking about uh, uh, really something that's just... Uh, a, a kind of a physical structure that's adapted very well for the person in terms of alignment, fitting, and the suitability of, let's say there's a knee joint in it, the suitability of that uh, for, for their own walking. Um, there's, but you know, in terms of research level, I mean, I think the most interesting thing I've seen in, in the last while is the exoskeleton uh, and the work that's been done where people who have, have paralysis or have, have a, a device fitted around them that enables actual the, the movement of walking uh, and there are health benefits with that. So, I mean, it's very advanced at the research stage, but what most people need, and you know, it's all about what people need, what most people need isn't necessarily something as advanced as that. So it's all different levels of technology from one 
and there's a spectrum to the other. Um, I, I think I'm kind of picking these out a little bit at random because they're jumping up and down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's great. There's so many questions. Yeah. Um, is there a broad engine? Um, I okay. Sorry, Gareth. I, I just spotted one there about skin engineering. Um, so currently, usually the procedure for skin grafting is that um, they try to take skin from somewhere else in the, in the person's body if they can or, or sometimes you can use thing like donor skin from from elsewhere so there is a lot of work in trying to develop tissue engineered skin but it's not used commonly at the moment um, in surgery but it would be very beneficial because you would be able to avoid having to harvest skin from elsewhere um, or use um, donor skin and um, okay, there's, there's a question is there a broad engineering course if you don't know what to do um, there's in, in, in DCU, but I think also in the other universities, uh, there's a kind of a common entry to engineering where you choose at the end of first year or in some places it might be second year. And, uh, you know, um, that leaves you the option of uh, taking a, a bit of time to work out which particular branch of engineering is going to, uh, you know, motivate you the most or interest you the most. Um, so, uh, the, the requirements don't tend to be any different to to the main engineering courses. You know, in DCU they're not. It's the same requirement, which is uh, honors maths, um, and uh, you know, then whatever points happen to be needed in any given year. Okay. Um, Do we want to move on with a few more slides, or maybe yeah, I'll, some I'll, questions I'll at the on, end? Uh, maybe move on quickly because. Uh, the, okay. And then we may, we may have time to come back to some questions. Okay, so um, I'll see if we can get to one second. Um, this is this is a uh, a European project that uh, DC is currently involved in, and uh, this is a kind of an introductory video to it. And then I'll talk a little bit about it. It's called Pandora. injuries, infections, diseases. There are many menaces to our body that can impact our abilities and welfare. Sometimes the damage is beyond what can be repaired by drugs or surgery, and we need something to take over the lost tissue. Biomaterials are natural or synthetic materials that are used in implants. Our body generally tolerates them well. However, this positive reaction is not universal. Complications such as infection or chronic inflammation can occur. Although there are some indicators, the prediction of such complications is not easy to attain, and things can turn really bad for our immune cells. Biomaterials can be used in all sorts of implants, from knee to dental implants. But how can a physician decide whether a material is right for a specific patient? Or how can we know if a novel biomaterial is safe to use? This is why we started Panbiora. Our ambition is to provide a system that can facilitate the use of novel biomaterials and decrease biomaterial related complications by providing personalized reaction profiles to a given biomaterial. Panbiora is an integrated system for facilitating the risk assessment of biomaterials. By miniaturizing the existing methods with novel state-of-the-art technologies, the PanVR system will provide better, faster, and cheaper assessment of biomaterials. The potential impacts of such a technology will be the decreased rate of biomaterial-related complications, savings in healthcare costs, and better clinical outcomes for implants. By developing new standards for evaluation of biomaterials, Canbiora strives to give access to a wider population for implant procedures. Visit our project website and learn more about Panbiora. Okay, so that's a uh, the Panbiora European project. DC are involved. Uh, a few colleagues, including myself, uh, work with that, and uh, it's led by a company in France. And uh, the so I mean, and the reason for it is that uh, the European Union and the governments generally, I suppose. Um, are concerned that medical devices are uh, safe uh, and effective for people, but also going into the future that we have the basis for taking advantage of uh, a lot of the new understanding that's coming with biomaterials that actually have ways of um, 
confirming their safety so that they can be used in new medical devices. Okay, and uh, two of the uh, areas that the Pan Biora project is interested in or you know ta has taken as kind of case studies are dental implant infection. Uh, so we see here in this uh, diagram the normal scenario with a, a dental implant that's been screwed into the bone and uh, securely fixed that way and moving towards early, early peri-implantitis, moderate, and then in the, uh, the final one, kind of advanced peri-implantitis, which is uh, an infection that would be painful and could potentially uh, you know, have negative effects for, the, for the keeping the tooth. Okay? And over on the, uh, on the right here is an image of a pacemaker infection. And uh, you can maybe not see clearly, but that's the collarbone of the person up near the top of the image there and, and the armpit. And so that's where a pacemaker has been implanted below the skin and where an infection has developed. And we, you know, where there are problems with these very beneficial medical devices, but where there are problems, um, we need to kind of get advanced understanding in order to make sure that the next generation of, uh, of implants uh, solve the problem. Okay. And so the idea with the Pan Bureau project was uh, to create a, a a device, a kind of an instrument um, that would, would uh, conduct uh, in an automated way a number of different advanced assessments on a biomaterial. And uh, I won't go in, especially because we're tight on time now, but looking at how antibodies react, looking at how cells react, and looking as well um, on models for how organs might react. So where something is a bit more complicated in terms of the arrangement of the cells, the different cells that might be there and the different flow conditions that might be there, setting that up and seeing uh, if uh, something more systemic or systematic would happen um, uh, that would explain uh, or predict a difficulty with a biomaterial. And so in Pambiora, it's the, um, the lung, the liver and uh, the, um, uh, it's not the heart, the lung, the lung and the liver anyway, uh, that are uh, being looked at um, as uh, organs, uh, particularly the lung actually. Um, what we see down here, part of the project being uh, conducted by a company uh, in Europe is simulating, using the kind of computational methods we had talked about, simulating uh, with mathematical models fundamentally, but kind of a computational scheme as well, how, uh, how the whole system is behaving and in the end, there's, uh, it would generate a lot of data uh, and ha having good data analytics can lead you to be able to make um, very understandable uh, determinations in terms of where on a spectrum of risk a biomaterial lies. So um, I won't dwell too much on this slide, but this is an, uh, an image of a design that has been uh, done by a company in Dublin Dolman Design, who are partners in the project, uh, looking at what the final uh, device will look like. And what we have here is uh, an, an early integration prototype, looking at integrating, because you're integrating uh, different chips and sensors and microscopes uh, and uh, uh, microfluidic channels where there's um, particular kinds of flow have to be generated. And uh, what we see there is a picture of uh, just before lockdown, actually, January 2020, uh, a big meeting that we had in, in Dublin City University. Uh, my colleague Harry Esmond is there holding court and demonstrating the device to all of the partners in the consortium. So um, that, that's a, it, as a project, and I suppose the reason I wanted to bring it up is because uh, it's, it's got a purpose that is you know, biological and biomedical. But there's a lot of engineering, uh, particularly mechatronic engineering expertise actually as well from, from DCU is going into uh, making, the, uh, making the device uh, function and perform and then lead to benefits with respect to, to new biomaterials. So um, biomedical engineering can seem uh, that it's very, um, you know, uh, focused on a limited number of, of, of things, but actually um, the, the expertise, I think, will, uh, 
you know, there's, there's so many new and interesting projects coming along into which biomedical engineers and other engineers can collaborate that it's, it's a very exciting time ahead. Okay. So, and just these are the, uh, the partners in the consortium. There's TCU there. Uh, there's a website if people are interested in it. There's more videos. Um, it's showroom.pambiora.eu. And, uh, you know, uh, to, to learn more about that, we can't, we can't spend too much time on it here. Okay. And uh, maybe Tanya, I can hand it back to you for a few minutes. Great. Um, so I see in our chat, we have lots of questions about jobs in biomedical engineering um, and the kind of industries you might work in. So this slide just shows some of the, the companies in Ireland um, where our graduates work, so our biomedical engineering graduates work. Um, in Ireland, it's a bit of a, a sort of hub for biomedical engineering. And in fact, it has 15 of the top 25 medical technology companies worldwide. And um, so a lot of the big um, international companies such as Stryker and Boston Scientific and Johnson & Johnson that make medical devices have um, are located here in Ireland and um, employ a lot of people in Ireland. And um, so that makes Ireland a really good place to be a biomedical engineer. Um, it's currently a very stable industry um, and Ireland uh, so the Irish-based medical technology sector it employs over 22,000 people in over 110 companies. Um, so you can see it's a really big employer here in Ireland as well. Um, so I think that's all good news if you're um, interested in biomedical engineering because it just shows that there are lots of jobs out there uh, for graduates. Um, so some of the companies I mentioned already, so there's Abbott, Medtronic, Boston Scientific, Johnson & Johnson, Stryker, Tyco, uh, Siemens Diagnostics um, and Smith and & Nephew. Um, and they all have uh, locations all around Ireland, you'll see them on the map there. Um, all right, so we'll move forward. Um, so why would you choose a career in biomedical engineering? Um, so as I mentioned, there's lots of employment opportunities when you graduate. Um, you can start straight from university. So when you graduate from our degree programs in DCU, um, uh, they're accredited programs with Engineers Ireland. Um, so you have an accredited degree that means you're qualified to go and work in a, in a company um, straight away from, from graduation. Um, so you can go out and start earning straight when you graduate, which is good. There's, I suppose, lots of other um, degrees. You maybe need to go and specialise before you, you can really work in the, in the uh, career that you want to work in. Um, it's very satisfying and it gives you a chance to be creative and um, so if you think that that's the kind of job you want to do if you feel like you're a creative person then maybe it could be a good fit and um, biomedical engineering has this focus on improving people's quality of life and um, so for some people that can be a really good motivation to work in the area and um, it, it has lots of um, variety so you can work in lots of different types of jobs as a biomedical engineer so you, you could be um, uh, out in a biomedical engineering company working on developing devices and um, you could be uh, maybe working closer with the medical professions on um, some other uh, aspect of um, biomedical engineering so it's quite varied and there's lots of different opportunities and um, there was a question in the chat there the question and answer about the pay so usually it's quite a well-paid job and um, so you can you can get um, paid well in the biomedical engineer, engineering industry which is a benefit I suppose as well um, and there's another question about teamwork. So usually as a, an engineer, you work in teams. So you'd work with lots of different types of people. It could be people from marketing or sales. You could be working with uh, various different people in uh, from different business roles, or you can be working with um, maybe doctors or um, uh, physiotherapists or, or people from that kind of background as well. And there's good opportunities for travel. So again, as an engineer, you could work in Ireland, but you could also work anywhere in the world as well. Um, and you can get your engineers, uh, become an accredited engineer, which really gives you that um, um, qualification to work anywhere you want in the world. Um, it's, it, there's lots of opportunity for problem solving. So you build your problem solving skills, which can open up other opportunities. So employers like people that are good at problem solving. So all the problem solving that we teach our students in DCU, um, uh, employers really like that. And it comes in really useful in, in your careers then uh, as you go on as well and opens up lots of opportunities. Um, so just to mention a little bit about the DCU programme, just before we finish up, there was a couple of questions about points. Um, so we offer uh, different programmes in DCU. Uh, we have a four-year honours um, degree programme. Um, so there's a, an optional, sorry, an optional one-year 
master's program as well, then that would give you a, a master's in biomedical engineering. Um, and then we now have a new five year integrated program, which is a bachelor and master's program that's integrated together. So you can graduate then with a master's. Um, I just was looking at the points there a second ago, just to refresh. Um, so I think that they're around 440, around that sort of mark. Um, so that's kind of the points you'll be aiming for um, if, you're, if you're looking to, to qualify for the course. Um, so as I mentioned, then the, the bachelor's and the master's programme, they're both accredited with Engineers Ireland. And this is the professional body for engineers in Ireland. So it's important, I suppose, to, to be accredited that your degree is recognised by Engineers Ireland. 